So individual fitness. <clears throat> Number one, it's difficult to measure. Individual fitness basically means you've got to tag an individual from the time they're a newly formed zygote and then finally count how many of the offspring they leave. That's a daunting task. It's almost never done. It's obviously difficult in natural populations. Ironically, some of the best data sets which really haven't been analyzed that much are humans. Because there's a pretty good idea about who was born and you know who died and there's less information about traits, but a, kind of an unmined uh, rich set of data are a lot of these longitudinal cohort studies like the Framingham Heart Study which have been studied for certain medical conditions, but they measured a ton of things. You could certainly potentially use those to look for um, specific uh, traits that, that may influence fitness. So our focus now is how selection acts on a particular phenotype, so traits. So we started out with looking at traits, but no measurements of fitness, just trait divergence over time. We then moved to markers with no knowledge of traits, now we're moving on to kind of the direct measurement, having measurements of individual fitness and having trait values. But even if I find a fitness trait association, as we'll see, that doesn't necessarily imply that trait could be under selection because I could have a hidden trait that influences fitness that's correlated with my trait. And in that case, we'd get a false signal. So we're talking about some ways to get around that. So the first two lectures in this are going to talk basically about uh, measurement of, of fitness in individuals, and the next four lectures are going to talk about how we quantify that. Um, and we'll first st start about quantifying it if we simply look at a single trait, then we'll talk about quantifying it if I've got a vector of traits, there's multiple trait quantification. Okay. And where we're so because it's hard to basically measure this lifetime of fitness, fitness is often broken into several components or episodes. I might ask about viability selection. What's your ability to survive? And it also may be over a small window. So for example, I go into a forest, I look at a whole bunch of trees that are there, maybe I age those trees, and I look over a two-year period and see what the survival fraction is and maybe measure some traits on that. That's not lifetime fitness, that's measuring a component of lifetime fitness. Probably the most measured fitness component is reproductive success um, or fertility selection, where we simply take an individual and we ask how many offspring does that surviving individual leave? So I'm out there, I look at a bullfrog, I look at how many eggs that bullfrog lays, and that's some measure then of reproductive success. Again, it's a component because if you think about a life history graph, individuals have to survive, they have to find mates, they then have to have fertile matings, then they have offspring, and it's all those components together that gives us the total uh, lifetime fitness. And again, usually people only measure a component of that. Um, there's often a distinction made between natural and sexual selection. So everything up here is natural selection. Sexual selection means there's variance in mating success and, and that variance in mating success then generates variance in offspring number. So if there's variance in mating success, but it has no effect on offspring number, that is, if I mate once or I mate 50 times, that has no impact on the number of offspring I have, then um, uh, you don't have sexual selection. So the second lecture today will basically talk about measures of this and, and, and some issues involved in measuring sexual selection. So a lot of the field, the, the modern field of measuring fitness, traces back to a, a series of, of very influential papers in the early 80s by uh, Russ Landy, who we've already seen, Steve Arnold, and Mike Wade. And at the time, all three of these uh, individuals with the University of Chicago. And in basically in about four papers, they laid down the machinery that's been used in the field for the last 30 years or so. And it was extremely influential and very important and got people seriously thinking about putting a rigorous statistical framework on selection, some of the issues that came up. But it also turned out to be rather limiting, rather limiting in the sense that basically they assume that the fitness service, which we'll talk about in a second, how if I do a, a measurement of fitness as a function of trait value, they basically assume that fitness surface was at most a quadratic. So it could only have a single extremum, maximum or minimum. And of course, data aren't like that. Likewise, in those fitness regressions, they basically assume that the residuals were normal. 
And that's almost never the case as well. What we've seen in the last 15 years or so is movement a little bit away from this sort of uh, Landy Arnold framework of quadratic fitness surfaces to non-parametric fitness surfaces where you can have multiple peaks. And we've seen a lot of movement away from things like astro models to more realistic models for how the residuals are distributed. Bernoulli, Poisson, negative binomial, et cetera. And we'll talk all about that. But nonetheless, uh, uh, Landy, Arnold, and Wade basically set most of the machinery that you see today in, in fitnesses. They kind of have a huge impact. So how would you assign fitness components? Well, there's logically a couple of ways you could go. There is the easy way and the hard way, right? The, the hard way is I have a set of individuals and I tag them and I follow those individuals through time. So the classic longitudinal studies have been done on birds and typically birds on either small islands or small patches of habitat and even better, birds that you can get to nest, to nest in nest boxes. So you can actually measure and band everything. There's also been a fair bit of work done on ungulates. The soya sheep, which is basically a, 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 a bronze age a sheep that's sort of found on the tips of some of the islands on the, uh, off the north end of Scotland, have been extremely well studied. Uh, a, a really fun study is Ram Mountain in, outside of, uh, in, in Calgary, where they basically looked at bighorn sheep. Very interesting papers showed that trophy hunting is reduced to size of bighorn sheep, and the bighorn sheep basically have to mate earlier to compensate for that. So most of the longitudinal studies typically involve birds or mammals. They don't have to, but there are fewer individuals. They're a little bit easier to, easier to follow. But again, if you're clever in your system, you can potentially follow them over longer periods of time. Likewise, uh, a lot of work has been done on, on basically on plants. And the nice thing about plants is you can basically, when they seed, you can capture the seed and count the seed as an example of how many offspring they produce. So longitudinal studies is I follow a cohort over time, ideally over the entire fitness cycle, but very often it's not over the entire fitness cycle like the birds and, and mammals I talked about, but rather as I've got a cohort, let's say, of dragonflies, I tag those dragonflies, then I look at viability and look at mating success over some window. So it's still a longitudinal sample, but it's a longitudinal sample only through one cycle, one aspect of the full um, life cycle. Cross-sectional studies are a little bit easier. In cross-sectional studies, I simply walk in and I look at individuals and I ask, well, are you alive or dead? So the classic example this we'll talk more about is um, uh, Herman Bumpus, uh, who was, I think, dean of Brown at one point later on. Uh, there was a severe uh, ice storm in New England. And as he walked through the aftermath of this ice storm, he saw all these little frozen sparrows on the ground. So he took all these frozen sparrows in and put them by a fireplace. He didn't throw them in the fireplace. He put them by the fireplace. What he found was about half of them survived and half didn't. And so he measured like nine or ten characters on everyone. And even though this was the late 1880s, this is the classic data set people still analyze. So that's an example there of a cross-sectional study. I basically take a single snapshot or a very small window and ask about survive, not survive, mate, not mate. Um, so one of the issues then is if you have measurements over a series of fitness components, for example, viability, fertility, mating success, how do you quantify and assign those? So assume there's several episodes of selection. And that simply means that as you're tracking an individual along, there's several life stages. An episode, for example, could be I've got a plant. That plant is, is a, a perennial. It's in a rosette stage. And it may stay in that rosette stage for several years and then it may flower. So one stage could be survivability from, from staying in the rosette one year to the next year. One uh, thing could be if I have a rosette and it flowers, what's its viability? So we have different ways that we can measure these episodes of selection. So suppose we have a cohort of individuals indexed by R, we have N of them, and we then ask how we assign fitnesses on this. A key thing here, which can't be stressed enough, is considerable selection may have already occurred prior to the study. And this is a great uh, experiment by, uh, by 
John Kelly, and this notion about selection occurring before you measure a trait is called the invisible fraction. So what they did in this case was they had monkey flowers. Monkey flowers in the family Scrophulariaceae, they've got kind of a long trumpet, very elegant use. They're more common in the West. You see them most, most mountain ranges in the West have them. And what they noticed is in the literature, plants with large flowers uh, have better reproductive success. And the idea is maybe they attract more hummingbirds. So they basically had a control line and they selected for large and small flowers. So they had small, gen small flower genotype, control, large flower genotype. They then planted those in the field as basically seed. And what they saw here was that if you look at um, uh, uh, individual, so look at uh, fecundity of survivors, so in those plants that flowered, what you saw was that high plants had a much, plants with large flowers, so high flowers, had a much higher fecundity than the control or low flowers. And this is kind of consistent with literature that typically when you see large variation in flower size, plants with larger flowers often have more offspring, produce more seed. However, because these were lines, they could then ask about what about these lines, what happens before you flower? And what they found was when you plant these lines out and look at survivorship, the high flower lines, lines with large flowers, had the worst survivorship. Control had intermediate, and low flowered had the highest. So if you simply measure surviving plants that flower, you say, oh, well, there's obviously selection to drive you to large flower size. If you simply measure selection by survivorship, and again, this is before they flower, but you'd then say, well, these lines, which have small flowers, have higher survivorship. If you concatenate these together, what you basically see is the control and the low lines the total fitness is within sampling error from each other, but both those have much higher fitness than the large flower lines. So if you didn't catch this invisible fraction and simply looked at this snapshot here, you'd get a very misleading view. And this is the concern for any fitness components, what we call trade-offs. Here the trade-off is a, an increase, and presumably this is because of higher pollination. We're not sure, let's assume that's the case. You get an increase, in pollination rate, but that comes at the expense of reduced survivorship. And apparently what happens basically is you've got to grow a little bit longer in a time of high stress to get large flowers, and that's what impacts your survivability. There's the trade-off there where high flowering does well in one component of fitness, fecundity, and does poorly in another component of fitness, viability. So if you simply measured over here, you get a misleading picture of how the character is going to evolve. And that's a classic unavoidable problem. The other classic unavoidable problem is you see a trait change. Let's imagine I'm looking at, at pollination. And I notice that large flowers are pollinated more. So I, all of your flowers, I measure your size. I then put you out in the field and I measure bumblebee pollination. I sit back and then I score how often are flowers visited. So basically it's a mating success sort of thing then I can basically partition that and then basically, let's make life simple and assume you're either pollinated or not. So then I measure all the flowers. I put the pollinated ones over here. I measure their value and I get a selection differential. The overall values of the flowers and then the mean, the fitness weighted ones. And since, so only the ones that pollinate will say survive. And in that case, I see that bees come to larger flowers. So that you might think then, oh, large flower size is under selection. But suppose large flowers also have more nectar. So are the bees going to large flower sizes or are they going to nectar? And it simply happens that if you have a large flower, you have more nectar. We'll talk about ways to decouple those with regressions if you measure both those traits. But if you don't measure those traits, and assume bees hypothetically are keying in on nectar, when you go around and simply look at flower size, you'll think there's selection on flower size itself when there may not be none whatsoever. Question? Ah, we'll show that's not the case. <laughs> 
because you've got to decouple phenotypic and genetic correlations. So what really matters basically is the target trait. So, so let's phrase it this way. That's a great question. Let's phrase it this way. So, um, well, you're asking, so what you're saying is, so bees aren't picking up the nectar clue, they're picking up the flower clue. That's a separate issue, right? No, because in that case, bees are making their choice based on flower size, not based on nectar, right? But the other issue, suppose that, that, that nectar and flower size are phenotypically correlated, but not genetically correlated. So if you've got high breeding values for flower size, that says nothing about your breeding value for nectar. If direct selection is on nectar, flower size doesn't change in the next generation. And we'll talk about how you handle, I'll give one or two slides on multi-trait selection um, in terms of selection response. That's not a topic, but we'll, we'll talk about that. So we have this issue of invisible fraction. We also have this issue of hidden traits you haven't measured that influence your measure traits and influence fitness. We'll spend a lot of time talking about the latter, but invisible fraction is not much you can do with. It's just out there in a scenario like this where you see one thing for uh, uh, flower size and pollination, but something else for survivorship and flower size. If you didn't measure this, you'd never see it. So going back here, <clears throat> our issue is we want to follow how fitness changes over time in an individual. So I'm following an individual. And the key thing is this. Obviously, if that individual dies, it's easy to look at the mean of the population before and the mean of the population that survived. But now suppose the survivors mate and have differential mates. You then have to compute the mean of that population by weighting each phenotype by the number of mates they have. That is, if you're dead or alive, everyone here is the same fitness. But once you survive, when you start mating, then you get different fitnesses. We have to weigh those accordingly. So let W sub J be the fitness of individual R in the jth episode of selection. And for example, classic is the way at 0, 1, alive or dead. That's viability. Or it could be 17. You have 17 mates or you have 17 offspring. So fitness data is count data. It's either 0, 1 or it's number of mates, number of offspring. Uh, one of the things we, we typically do is we standardize this and talk about a relative fitness. And the relative fitness is basically given by taking your fitness and dividing it by the mean fitness of everyone else that gives you a relative fitness. So if we start selection, all individuals are weighted equally because we're assuming there's no history of prior selection. So when we do that, all in individuals have the same weight. So I take the fitness, and then W bar 1 is simply that average. After the first episode of selection, we then have to weight the individual observations a bit different. So um, after the first episode of selection, the Rth individual now has a fitness weighted frequency of 1 over n times W1, where W1 basically is its value here standardized by the overall mean. We'll work out an example in a second. What about now at the second fitness component? Well, that's W2. And to find the mean for W2, we then have, what is this expression here? That's the frequency of individual R. It's now fitness weighted. If it's zero, it's easy, but if it's number of mates, it could be, you know, 0 0.7, 0 0.4, whatever. So we now we compute the average value for the second fitness component. We take individual R and weight it by its current fitness value. We continue, and so in the, the jth episode of uh, fitness, the mean of that is simply that jth measure of, of absolute fitness. This expression here, which is down here, is simply the fitness weighted frequency of individual R going into the jth episode. So even though individuals may not change, for example, we have two groups. You're dead. Your fitness is zero. So your fitness weighted function is always zero. You survive. So your fitness weighted function is basically uh, uh, um, uh, 1 over n times 1. Then you have different number of mates. Let's say you have three mates. Unfortunately, you have no mates. So even though you would be in here, and I'd still see you, you wouldn't be dead, you'd have different weights assigned with you. Right? And so those weights would be, your weight would now be zero, even though you survive, because you have no mates. 
your weight would be the weight for surviving times the weight based upon the average number of uh, offspring people have. And again, we'll work, work out an example. So you can basically go ahead then and figure out what the mean and the variance for a specific trait is. So we're, we've talked so, so far about how the fitness weight of individuals change by weighting on fitness components. If I then want to ask how a particular trait changes, we then simply take the value for the trait an individual R and multiply it by the frequency for that individual after J episode. That gives me the mean of the trait in episode J, and of course I could change traits. I can also configure out the variance of the trait. So this is kind of abstract. Let's take a cute little organism here and work it out. So this is classic data for Howard for mating success in uh, bullfrogs where W1 was number of mates and W2 was eggs per mating. So I've, I've thrown a, a, a trait on here. You don't have to. But so here's body size. So uh, what we see here is that individuals one and two had one mates. Individual three, I guess you was unlucky. Individual four had two mates. Individual five was you know, on the football team or whatever. They had three mates. So if you then take that and ask, okay, what's that's the absolute fitness. What's the relative fitness? Well, the relative fitness basically is what's the average number of mates per individual? Well, 1 plus 1 plus 0 plus 2 plus 3 divided by 5 individuals. The average number of mates is 1.4. So even though these individuals had one mate and have higher fitness than here, they still have a lower fitness than the overall average. So their relative fitness is 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 1.4 and 2.1. So then we can ask, okay, given you've mate now, how many eggs do you have per mating? So the number of eggs you produce is basically number of matings times number of eggs. Fitness components are usually constructed, not always, but usually to be multiplicative. So obviously if you don't have any mates, once you have a zero here, everything is zero out here. But here are the number of eggs per mating. And you see, if you mate once, you've got a lot more eggs per mating than if you mate two or three times. So you can go ahead then and figure out, same slide, do I have it in here? Uh, so you, you can go ahead and, and, and do, do that again. You can then basically take these numbers here, and the average uh, number of eggs per mating is this value times the frequency after mating. So in, in episode two, there are the starting frequencies. It's not one-fifth. It's these for this individual, so that times that plus that times that plus that times that plus that times that gives you the average uh, 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 eggs per mating weighted by here. Then you divide that value by the observed, and here are the fitnesses you get. Right? So if you work it out, basically the average eggs per mating is a little bit under 1,500, is right around 1,500. And what you see is that these two individuals here have their W2 be fairly high because they, on average, have more eggs per mating than a random individual that's mated. This individual here is doing very poorly. This individual here is just slightly above the average. So you go ahead and do that. Go ahead, and that's the kind of the, the bookkeeping you do as you go through and assign fitness components by measuring. Here are the actual, this, this is the fitness components. That's what you measure. But then you've got to wait for the fact that this individual has had two mates, so the eggs per mating is weighted differently than an individual that has one mate. So there's a little bit of bookkeeping involved. But that's kind of how you go ahead and assign standard fitness components. Yeah. Sure. So basically, let's go back here. So there's our little frog. There it is. And you are five frogs. And unfortunately, since you asked the question, I'm going to make you frog number three. So even though you're still here... <laughs> And you're still hopping around. Maybe the cast did it, you know. You're still, still kind of limp. Well, you got the green Kermit cast, so that may have some street cred. Who knows? So you're, even though you're hopping around, for the purposes of fitness, you are dead. So, for example, I have no children by choice. I had seven brothers and sisters. My wife had two very obnoxious older brothers. So we're both very happy not to have kids. We have pets instead. So my fitness is zero. I could live to be 500, my fitness is still zero. So even though I see you in here, after the cycle of mating, your fitness is zero. 
So your weight for all other future calculations is zero. Congratulations, it must be the Brazilian genes. You have three mates. Uh, now, now I got the attention. So, oh, one, two, three, okay. So I overweight you. So what, what are the weights then of the five survivors? Right, so we have the four here and five back there. So you have one mate. Not bad, you know. So your weight then basically is, so if you look, the average number of mates, zero, one, one, two, three, the total number of mates we have here is seven. So the average mates per individual is 1.4. So your fitness now, your absolute fitness is one. Your relative fitness is one divided by the fitness number of offspring for a random individual, 1.4. That gives me P1. Your one divided by 1.4, that gives me P1. Your two divided by 1.4, and your three divided by 1.4, right? So that's where the fitness weighting comes from. And the key part there is that simply because an individual is around doesn't mean they're weighted equally. That's the case if they survive or don't survive. But you can think about cycles as being several episodes you have to, or stages you have to pass through. And then once you pass through those, then you become of mating age. And you either mate or don't mate. And if you do mate, then we count how many offspring you have, or maybe even more components. So if you're a flower, we might count, do you flower, yes or no? If you flower, how many brackets do you have? How many you know, inflorescences do you have per bracket? You can break this down further. And the, way, the reason people often break components down further is you want to ask specific ecological questions about trade-offs. Do plants with lots of flowers tend to have smaller flowers? So is it the case you get the same amount of flowering per plant, independent if you have got a few large flowers or a bunch of small flowers? So people often break fitness components down to ask questions like that. Yeah. So we're assuming, which we'll get around in a second when we talk about astro models, we're assuming there's a linear progression. Episode one happens, then episode two, then episode three. That need not be the case. So for example, you could have a perennial plant. It may flower or not. In year two, it may not survive to year two. It may flower or not if it survives. It may not survive to year three. It may flower or not. In that case, you don't have this logical progression. The way we handle that, we put a life history graph up and we work on that. And when we talk about astro models, we'll talk about that. The term astro model actually comes from the fact they're working on asters. And this is the approach they developed. Good question. So basically, P is, so, so um, uh, when we start out, the frequency of each of the individuals is one-fifth. If I draw a random individual, there's a one-fifth chance I'll get this. I then weight individuals by their fitness. So if I draw a random individual that's mated, there's a 42% chance it'll be individual five, like because they get overweighted because the fact they've mated three times, they basically are in the pot three times. So P1, so W1, so capital W1 is absolute, little w1 is relative. P1 now is what is the fitness weighted proportions of these individuals. So instead of being one fifth, these are um, uh, so, for example, this individual is basically uh, counts twice as much. Is that why it's got two mates? This individual counts three times as much. Why? Because it has three mates. So you're basically doing, what it is, is a fitness weighting of the individuals. And that's what the P1 is. So then, we'll come back to question in a second. So then, okay, what's now the average value of W2? Well, here's the W2 value, but the average value isn't that plus that plus that, plus that, divided by five or four, it's that times the fitness-weighted frequency of that individual, plus that times the fitness-weighted frequency, plus that, plus that, plus that. That thing gives you your W2 bar, and you divide two down. Uh, no, it's basically your, your, your progression going through. And what really matters here, basically, is your representation. Because when we compute a fitness trait association, 
we typically don't use W's this. So for example, I can ask, and this slide does it here, what's, so beforehand, the, the mean beforehand I think is, I think it's like 135. What's the mean after, the fitness weighted mean after one round of mating? Well, the fitness weighted means now are that times that plus that times that plus that times that plus that times that plus that times that, which gives you basically 139. So these now is your fitness weighted mean. So even though all five frogs are still hopping around, they're weighted differently because now we, the fitness weighted means accounts for how many mates you have. Likewise, if you go through the second episode, these are now the weights as well on these individuals. So now the, in, in episode two, so the weights are over here. In episode two, the mean would be that times P2 plus that times P2, that, that, that time, et cetera. So we compute these fitness weighted frequencies and we can then use those to basically then adjust how the traits change. Yeah. That's exactly correct. Yeah, they're, they're set to standardize to add up to one. And you can think about it, what are the, if you weight individuals by fitness, what's the, what's the chance you'll draw individual five? Well, chance you'll draw individual five is 0.43 after the first episode and about the same thing after the second episode. What about individual one? It's about 14% after the first episode. It's about 22% after the second. The idea is that, that it's pretty easy. If you live or die, it, it makes categories very easily. But if you survive but don't mate, then individuals here, even though they're all surviving, have different intrinsic weights with respect to fitness. So if you have no children, even if you're the only frog surviving after the summer, your fitness is still zero. So you basically have to weight them by their fitnesses. And so this is why it, it, when you individual fitnesses, you can then assign them What's the impact of different episodes, which allows you to look for trade-offs? You can also ask, how, what's the representation of that individual after the first cycle, second cycle, fifth cycle, et cetera? And then you can basically track how the character might change over those cycles. Okay. This side has been heavy on the questions. Any questions over here? Because sometimes when I focus on here, there may be some on the periphery that I've missed. This is, yeah, uh-huh. Um, so you can always, fitness components are somewhat of an arbitrary construct, and so they're, how you weight them depends upon the questions you're asking. Now the bigger issue is, what happens if I don't have this sequential pattern? Or if I've got two branches which come together and get the same thing? And in those cases where we handle it, you make a life history graph, and you do these things on the graph. That allows you to handle very arbitrary structures. For example, if I'm a plant that has a rosette, and the rosette either goes through another year as a rosette or it flowers and dies, then that life history is rather interesting. I've got a loop and it takes this stage and asks what's the survival of this stage back on itself? What's the survival of this stage to the rosette, to the flowering, etc.? So I'm presenting it here as this nice linear progression. For starters, it doesn't have to be, and astrographs allow you to handle very arbitrary types in a very clean fashion. Sure. Yeah, we'll talk all about that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And the answer is it does. <laughs> and it varies over time. That's it. I mean, how, you know, we don't, there's no general explanation or pattern for how it varies. It just does vary. You have to measure it. Yeah. It makes a huge number of assumptions. So, for example... So, well, so here, here, you're looking at frogs that survived, and maybe it's the frogs that are real Casanovas, right? They have a really wild childhood as a tadpole, and most of them die. So when they, yeah, so if you could tag them, let's imagine you had like a high mating line, a low mating line, and the high mating line being Brazilians, they're in the bars all night as little tadpoles, and they're doing wild and crazy stuff, and so they've got a much lower survival rate, but when they survive, man, they're like the best. So that's that invisible fraction we talked about. And that always hangs over any study you do. And we'll talk more about some really cool examples of invisible fractions. Probably neatest is Barry Sonero did a really nice experiment using micro dissection and hormonal treatment 
to show that high fecundity lizards suffer survivalship before that fecundity gets to be expressed. We did really cool things like cutting the number of ovaries in the lizard so they had low fecundity and they actually increased their survivalship before fecundity. So the invisible fraction is always something that hangs over your head because it's extremely rare to do lifetime measurements of fitness. We usually capture some snapshot and we assume that, that snapshot may be representative of a trait, but of course you could have trade-offs on traits. So here we are asked to. So what about non-sequential fitness components? Often, for example, overlapping generations, episodes are not sequential but could be simultaneous. I could either, as a rosette, stay a rosette and survive one more year, have a bigger rosette and therefore have potentially more flowers, or I could decide to flower now. Right? Those things come from the life history evolution. That's a trade-off. That's not kind of an obvious progression. It's kind of a split in what you can do. How do you measure those? Well, they're handled by life history graphs. Here we are. And Bruce Shaw um, and, uh, and um, what's the guy's first name? Um, Char yeah, that's right, Charlie Geyer um, came up with, oh, okay, with astro models. And so here they are. So, so that, that's, actually, that's the aster that Ruth worked on. So Ruth is one of our best evolutionary um, plant ecologists. And another one of her claim to fame is she and I were both with Joe Felsenstein. She was a postdoc after I was there. But she was able to convince Joe to babysit her child while she went and took classes. And that's really impressive. Uh, Charlie is one of the leading statisticians. If you read a bunch of stuff on Markov Chain Monte Carlos, um, his papers are really amusing because he always says, in my humble opinion, and then makes some crazy statement. But um, So he's really fun to read as well. They're both University of Minnesota. Fun fact, sister brother. So it's good to have a statistician in the family. Although Ruth is a great statistician on her own. So you'll see Ruth's name come up a fair bit in other things as well. She and Tom Mitchell Oles are the other group that did a lot of input to to extend these Landy Fisher models. But here's the basic idea behind the Aster model. There's the Aster, and here's a life history graph. And as you see, it's kind of not obvious. So I have an individual, it starts up there. And that individual then must survive to either year one, year two, or year three. So if it survives to year one, is a chance of surviving to year two. Survive to year two, it could survive to year three. That part is sequential. But the second part is, well, if it survives, it could flower in year one. And if it flowers in year one, there's a certain number of flowers on it. So what you see here is this captures biology in a much more reasonable fashion. If they survive for just one year, you'd have this graph there. That'd be a nice linear progression. But you don't have that. So aster models are extremely flexible because they allow you to capture things like this. And so, for example, this could be the rosette model as well. In year one, you either flower in which case, in that life history graph, you die, or you go to Rosette and survive to year two. Year two, either flower, in which case you die. So you basically make very arbitrary life histories, and the life history graph allows you to nicely handle non-sequential things. So here, your ultimate fitness is number of flower heads here, but there's several routes you can get to get there. And graphs are a natural way to present things where there's a succession, but there's also branches in that succession. So these are called aster models. We'll come back and talk a little bit more about them. And the big feature about them isn't just simply the graphical representation, but the key feature is getting much more realistic distribution on the residuals. So for example, that's a Bernoulli random variable. Bernoulli is a zero one. You flip a coin. That is also Bernoulli, but that may be, for example, Poisson or binomial. So when you look at the number of flower heads, you actually have a rather complicated distribution that's not at all normal. And so if you want to do statistics on that, you can't assume normality, but the Astra models allow you to do statistics because they allow you to actually capture what that complete distribution of fitness is on. And we'll talk a lot about that uh, probably, probably tomorrow. Okay? And the book talks about that a lot as well. So the other thing I won't say much about, and once again, kind of points you. So there's a, a really interesting area that's developed, and um, it goes by several uh, different uh, uh, names. So one name is indirect genetic effect. Have people heard about that before, IGEs? 
And the basic idea is this. I'm sitting up here, and let's imagine my phenotype is how energetic I am as a lecturer. And I'm looking out there, and you all, everyone's doing this, and they're focusing on me. That makes me more energetic. Or you're doing this. That makes me less energetic. My phenotype is influenced by phenotypes of individuals around me. Right? So my phenotype is energetic. Your phenotype is attentiveness. Those can both evolve independently. And there's a really interesting body that's developed to handle evolution of those where my phenotype is determined by my genes and individuals will interact with. And the reason this is really nice is this framework now puts together a huge number of things, such as kin and group selection, such as evolution of behaviors like altruism, such as group level traits. Imagine your trait is density of the group or size of population. That's not an individual trait, that's a trait of a group. How can you model that? Well, indirect genetic effects in the earlier framework was an idea by Bruce Griffin called associative and direct effects. That allows you to handle all that. And the nice thing is you can actually estimate the genetics on these using mixed models in a very clean fashion. I won't say much about that at all, but just point that area out to you. That would kind of be a whole course in itself. But chapter 22 uh, discusses that in detail and gives you all the references. So this leads to the other question. When individuals interact, where is fitness best assigned? And the classic example is I have extensive maternal care. So your survival depends upon traits in you, but it also depends in part on me. So at least the classic paper was called, Whose Fitness Is It Anyhow? The standard idea is not to cross generations. That is, your fitness simply depends upon you. I can't, in, hard people, hardcore people would argue that my fitness as a mother depends upon how many offspring I leave, not how many offspring that survive. But others will counter, well, offspring survival, in some sense, is a function of the mother, not just genes, but how she cares for the offspring. So where do you assign that fitness? And so one of the reasons that comes up is that if you talk with people that work with things with extensive maternal care, typically avian and bird, but obviously insects and other things do that, right? Arthropods, there are arthropods that have, have maternal care. For example, um, the bellostomatid giant water bugs lay eggs on the back of the male, and the male carries around. I guess there, there are beetles that have maternal care as well. So you can have these maternal care structures, but in uh, birds and mammals, people typically don't take fitness as the number of eggs you lay. They take fitness as measurements later. So we often then take uh, fitness as hatchlings. I don't care if you laid an egg, did it hatch? That's not unreasonable unless the egg died because of some feature of the character you're looking at. Or, more generally, they take it as fledglings or animals that have become weaned. They no longer need the mother. So that, that sort of makes sense because there's a period there where if you don't take care of them, it doesn't depend upon their traits, it depends upon the mother's traits. So very often, when you talk about reproductive success, number of offspring, that should be number of eggs. But bird people and mammal people often take reproductive success as number of hatchlings, that is, eggs that hatched, or more generally, number of fledglings, or the extreme number of recruits. Recruits are individuals that go on to breed successfully. And I guess the thought here was that your parent teaches you strategies to be successful so you can breed. I think this is pushing a bit much, but you'll often see lifetime reproductive success were measured as eggs or measured as fledglings or measured as recruits. So if I have seven eggs, my lifetime reproductive success in number of eggs is seven. If five of them hatch, my lifetime reproduction in terms of hatchlings is five. If four of them fledge, or if I'm a mammal weaned, my lifetime reproductive success would be four. If two of them subsequently mate, my lifetime reproductive success would be two. You obviously see the problem. Where do you basically call it? Whose fitness this belongs to? And the bottom line, basically, is you can think of it this way. I won't go into detail, 
this, this is in chapter 30, but what you really have is a multiple trait problem. Your fitness, if it's determined just by you, then all those fitness is assigned to the offspring. If there's a component where your mother also influences your fitness, so for example, here is your fitness, your fitness could be influenced by traits in you and also traits in your mother, and the way you basically partition where you assign the fitness is to make these fitness models where you basically take a trait and ask if that trait influences offspring survival when it's in the mother, and you can then measure some of these things in the framework that we'll talk about. So we're not going to, I'm not going to say much more about this interesting issue of whose fitness it belongs to, but just point out that, that there's an issue with a lot of discussion, and there are a lot of references to that uh, in chapter 29. Is two, what question? No, he always, philosophical questions are great. Because you can bullshit about them all day long, and you're always right. Well, we'll talk about that. It's a great question. So there's two separate issues. Right now, we're simply trying to assign for you fitness components over several different episodes. That is trade independent. Because that's the raw data we'll then use and then map traits on top of that and ask if certain traits have advantages, disadvantages, different fitness episodes if those traits show trade-offs. So right now it's trait independent. The reason I show this trait graph back here for assigning offspring fitness is then it does sign, it often then falls down to what traits you follow. But for now we're assuming that we're simply taking you and assigning fitness components and I haven't measured any trait because we then take that and then apply traits on those a little bit later on. So these first two lectures are simply measuring fitness components, independent of traits. So then, then it be, so when you have interacting individuals, how you classify whose fitness it is, the, the, the reason it becomes complicated, if you think about a single fitness, is you really have interacting fitnesses and that makes it a multiple trait problem. So the, chapter 22 talks about how you, you put those interactions into what are called direct fitness effects and associated fitness effects. Direct effects are things that you yourself, uh, are, the, the phenotype is determined by genes in you and that affects fitness. Associative effects are effects on your fitness that's determined by the phenotype of others. If those others are related to you, there's correlations. That's where kin selection comes in. So there's a, there's a big stuff there. I'm just kind of sliding by. It's, it, it, it's important, but it takes a while to get into. So if you're really interested, don't necessarily buy the book, but in your library when it comes in, read chapter 22 because it talks about that. I think it's actually one of the more important chapters in the book because it puts together interacting individuals, evolution of behavior, group and kin selection. So how many... Group and kin selection is this really messy. If you read the literature on group and kin selection, it's like you have a, a small room and someone throws in 20 cats and they all start fighting, right? And you know, the, uh, it's the, this quote is often attributed to Kissinger, but someone before him said it, I forget exactly who. But it's the battles in academics are so vicious because the stakes are so small. And group and kin selection in the associative effects framework are basically just different axes. You can have both of them or none of them, and all the mysterious stuff goes away because you reduce to something where you can measure is selection acting on groups or kins. You can also measure what the genetics are. And once you can measure stuff, it makes things a bit less abstract. Because some of these group and kin selection discussions, people just, you know, I think the term is terminal cranial rectal insertion. Way, they had way up there, but. And so when you put it into associate effects framework, these things become far cleaner, and you can actually separate things. We'll talk a little bit about levels of selection and how you put them in, into that. So we can actually talk about if you have fitness, is it influenced by individuals around you? And we'll talk about how you actually do that uh, near the end, probably the last lecture. So, we, so far we've been talking about situations where the astro model is a bit different, 
where we don't have overlapping generations. If I do have overlapping generations, then let me pose the following question. Suppose that we live to age 40, and I have a kid at age 20, 25, and 30, and you have three kids at age 40. Our lifetime reproductive success is the same. Who do you think has higher fitness? The one that reproduces earlier because they're putting more genes in and they kind of have a higher rate of that. So the obvious question becomes, that's kind of an intuitive concept. How can you quantify that and how can you measure that in a way that makes sense? So we're now going to talk about that. And, yeah. So, okay, uh, so lifetime reproductive success is counting the number of eggs. So in the example I just gave you, we both have the same lifetime reproductive success. So here's a, another example. Three individuals, which all produce a total of 40 offspring. So each has the same fitness when measured by lifetime reproductive success. But individual one has 10 offspring at age two, three, and four, or two, three, four, and five. Individual two has 20 offspring at ages four and ages five. And individual three has 20 offspring at ages two and three. So all three individuals leave 40 offspring, but the pattern, the timing where they leave them is different. So it's kind of obvious that individual three has the highest fitness, but how much higher than the others? How can you do that? How can you, how can you rank that? And is individual one more or less fit than individual two? So how can we, how can we do that? And the way we do that is to use projection matrices. So these are often uh, framed as age projection. And age projection means you have a series of stages. Stage one, so age one, age two, age three. So you're always progressively moving through the, through the ages. The same idea holds for stages. And that stage could be, for example, I'm a plant. I could be a rosette. In which case, I could stay that rosette. So I go from one stage in one cycle. Then I go back to that stage. So we often talk about age projection matrices, but you can also write these as stage projection matrices. And the basic idea is due to Leslie, they're often called Leslie matrices. And here's the basic form. So if you go across here, so this is the number of offspring that individuals in the first category leave. And if this is the number of offspring that individuals in the second category leave, the K minus first category, and the last category. The L here is a chance from going from category one to category two. Category, sorry, category zero to category one. So one to two, two to three. And finally, this is the last step because once you get here, everyone else dies. I said it wrong. This is a chance from going to two. This is a chance of going to three. This is a chance um, to, to go to, the, to, to uh, uh, the, the last step. And so this is a way basically of modifying modeling population growth. It's called the Leslie matrix. And the key features on this is that if you take that matrix and look at its eigenvalues, people remember eigenvalues and eigenvectors? So who feels a little shaky on that? Don't be bashful. Okay, fine. We'll be happy to. That's why I asked. If you don't ask, I assume you know them, and I'll get it, give you more and more sophisticated stuff. So the idea behind eigenvalues and eigenvectors is pretty simple. And suppose I have a matrix A, and I have a vector X. When I multiply a matrix by a vector, what does it do? Well, a vector, you can think of it as a string of numbers. A string of numbers is an arrow. Coordinate 1, coordinate 2, coordinate 3. So I have an arrow that's X. When I multiply A by X, that gives me a new arrow. It may be a different dimension if x isn't square, but what happens is that that arrow then is potentially rotated and scaled. It points in a different direction and the length is different. There are certain vectors where if I multiply a by them, I get out a vector that points in the same direction. So things underline are vectors. So if I have, they're called eigenvectors. If this is an eigenvector matrix, if it points in this direction, 
then after I multiply it by the matrix, it also points in that direction, but it may be of smaller length or larger length, or it may be exactly flipped about the axis. That means I've got a negative eigenvalue. So the eigenvectors basically are the intrinsic geometry of that matrix. If I have a vector pointing in a specific direction, when I multiply it by that matrix, it doesn't change direction. That's the eigenvector. The corresponding scaling on that is the eigenvalue. And so if I do an age projection matrix like this, the leading, the largest eigenvalue gives me the long-term asymptotic growth rate. So if it's 1.04, it means the long-term growth rate is 1.04. The vector associated here are which individuals are in which stages. And if I run that long enough, eventually I get to what's called the stable age distribution. So the fraction of individuals in those stages doesn't change. And those fractions are given by the eigenvector corresponding to the largest eigenvalue. Right, so that's kind of how you look at overlapping generations. And that's kind of a discrete time view because I assume there are discrete steps I go to. You can also make the whole thing in continuous time and you basically replace these by integrals, which is a bit more complicated, but the basic idea holds true. So that's kind of, we can measure an overall population growth rate for a population by those leading eigenvalues. That suggests, maybe we do the same thing for individuals. So um, the classic book on this is Matrix Population Models, and this is Caswell that, that put together here. I think he was at Woods Hole or one of the groups out there at the time. And so this asymptotic growth rate is the largest eigenvalue of this matrix, or more generally the largest singular value, because it's not a square matrix. Um, you could also take this idea and make it stages. So for example, suppose I've got a value on the diagonal here. What does that mean? That's a chance from in the next cycle staying in that stage. So if I have a rosette, let's say that value is 0 0.2, it means if I'm a rosette, there's a 0.2 value in the next cycle, I'm also a rosette. So by having this simple form here of a single line on below the diagonal and then a line up here which could contain a bunch of zeros, if you don't reproduce towards here, those are all zeros, the line below here is a linear progression of ages, but that's a special case. You could have elements on the diagonal, that means you stay in that case, or off the diagonal elements could mean you jump across stages in more elaborate situations. But the bottom line is, just like a graph can nicely represent very unusual life history structures, a matrix can also do that as well. In fact, you can always express a matrix as a graph and vice versa. Yeah. Sure. Right. So I would put that, so if you have hermaphrodites, I would actually put that in a life history graph because your stage could be, you know, stay hermaphroditic or mate, right? So your, your life cycle is not linear. It's a bit more involved. And by putting this life history graph, then you could go back and map it on to, with a little more thought, map it onto an appropriate uh, stage matrix. So always writing your life history as a graph is a good way to go because it'll force you to think about what the things are. And for example, if you're hermaphrodite, do you self? Do you outcross, right? There are lots of decisions you can make in that. That gives you bifurcations and not linearity. But the, the, the life history graphs will handle all that. So a suggestion, and it started with, uh, with Service and, uh, uh, and Linsky and Service, so Rich Linsky and, and Phil Service, was to consider individual fitness in this fashion. So in this life history matrix down here, for the entire population, this is the growth rate of the population determined by the average number of offspring you leave and also by the average survivorship. Those can obviously evolve, and Russ and I did a whole bunch of work asking how that can evolve, but that's for a population. This then, the, the reproductive growth rate of that population is given by the largest eigenvalue of that matrix. This suggests that a measure of fitness when you have structured populations, is this. So you know your individual has survived up to this cycle. I'm sorry, up, up, to, up to stage uh, M, 
So for that individual, you replace these probabilities of survivals by one. So if you only survived age two, your matrix is now cut off at two. If you survive longer, your, your matrix is longer. And these numbers up here are a little bit different. So these are the average number of offspring produced by individuals in group one, group two, group three. We replace those by half the number of offspring that an individual produced. Why half? It's got a partner. Hermaphrodites, that half would just be that number. So in hermaphrodites, you'd modify that. That'd be one modification. So the suggestion then was that perhaps the best way to measure fitness is to, with, with overlapping generations, is to take this matrix where it's different for each individual, right? Because those values are different for each individual and certain individuals will survive and, and not, so the number of ones down here is different. And then compute the eigenvalue for that matrix. And that's the growth rate of that individual and that's your measure of fitness when you've got age structured populations. Um, and this is called age discounted reproductive success because in that example I showed you with three individuals all had a lifetime reproductive success of 40. <clears throat> individuals that made it earlier, as we'll see in a second, have a higher fitness. So um, there's, there's the, the, the book talks a bit more about one of the problems with this approach is if I take the average eigenvalues over all the individuals, it doesn't match the leading eigenvalue here. So there's a non-linearity, but still, uh, uh, they still forcefully argue, especially uh, Caswell forcefully argues, this is where you want to go. Another aspect you can get at it is if lambda is the overall growth rate for your entire population, then this discounting here, number of offspring you leave, this now gives you the fitness for individuals J. So it's a different way to compute this, where here you get lambdas uh, for each individual, and here you get an overall lambda, and this basically then gives you a, an adjustment for each particular individual. In both ways sort of makes sense to me. The idea is you're using some sort of age discount. Let me look at an example, I think it makes more sense. So remember the example we had before? We had three individuals, they each gave a total of 40 offspring, so individual one had 10 in ages two, three, four, and five. So these matrices now use half of that. You'll notice this individual here survives. What, individual two waited until ages four and five to have 20 offspring each. So we take half of those. Individual three had offspring in ages uh, two and three. It may have lived a bit longer, but basically once you stop having offspring, we don't care. So for these three matrices, the eigenvalue for matrix one is 2.7. The eigenvalue for matrix two is a little bit under two. The eigenvalue for matrix three is about 3.6. So highest fitness, next highest fitness, lowest fitness. And again, it's entirely determined by the eigenvalues of these. So for each individual, you basically ask, what's the reproduction in each particular stage Take half of that, and that would construct your matrix here because you'd have ones below the diagonal because they survive. Then compute the eigenvalues for those matrices, and you're done. So that's a way to do, to, to switch. We call that lambda individual, so individual growth rate as compared to lifetime reproductive success. And again, all three of these individuals have the same lifetime reproductive success, but what lambda individual does is it discounts them. These, this takes longest to get those individuals, therefore it's discounted the most, and the discounting is a natural way because you're kind of looking how the population grows. So how well does that work? You all recognize the Ural owl here. Well, I didn't, so I'd look it up. I, what I tried to do, by the way, the book is not as cute. There's very few pictures in the book, lots of graphs, lots of equations, but I figure by putting random cute organisms in here, you know, we're all biologists at heart, and this kind of takes the organism. That's why we have that funny little strip on the book of an organism and an equation, organism and equation, because our focus is how organisms evolve, but we talk about equations through there. So this is a very nice study where they looked at lifetime reproduction. So each dot is an individual, and for each individual, they computed lifetime reproductive success. They also then computed the individual uh, growth rate. 
And what you basically see is it asymptotes out fairly quickly. So you can have a large lifetime reproductive success. But the net result is, um, as your reproductive success gets larger and larger and larger, you get this massive discounting here. And so debates go back and forth as to whether this discounting is too severe. And the book gives you references to some of the debates or not. But we've got two measures of fitness, how many offspring you leave, lifetime reproductive success, and this discounted weight accounting for overlapping populations. What you clearly see is early on there's a really clear uh, distinction, but as you have high, in this species at least, when you have high lifetime reproductive success, um, uh, reproductive success up here doesn't necessarily translate into this measure here of fitness. So questions about that. The, what we've done here is we've now moved, we started out by talking about <coughs> components of fitness and how you measure and wait for those. We then talked about um, what happens if you don't have a sequential pattern. You can use a graph to catch, capture those. We then talked about what happens if you've got age structure or stage structure. What's the appropriate way to measure the discount? Because two individuals could have the same lifetime number of offspring, but those individuals that have them earlier should have higher fitness because they contribute more genes to the population. We then talked about these Leslie matrix and more general stage matrix, stage matrices approaches for uh, doing that. And that gives us two measures, lifetime reproductive success and this largest eigenvalue of the matrix here, we'll call that land individual, sort of the individual growth rate that that individual would have. That's where we are. So questions so far. And again, there's details. The book talks about a lot of these details, gives you references and things like that. But the nice thing is we now have machinery to handle much more general fitness scenarios than Landy and Arnold uh, and Wade thought about. We can do these branching fitness patterns. We can also account for discounted rates when you've got uh, overlapping populations in age structure. Yeah. <clears throat> so that be a missing data problem. And what you can do is you can either uh, uh, treat that data as missing or you can do a separate model for those individuals. So for example, if you missed four stages, uh, then you, you, you the, the part of the problem is if you miss some stages, you might miss flowering, right? And in that case, is you really probably have to throw that it, throw certain parts of that data out. You can certainly ask about survivorship, but you couldn't ask about number of flowers because you'd miss some of those cycles. Life's 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 not easy. Measuring fitness isn't for wussies, right? It's not easy. It's not at all easy, right? And that's the problem is that that's why there's not a lot of measurements out there is it's even when only looking at a couple of fitness components, it could be really hard. Imagine trying to follow dragonflies mating, right? Well, you can do that if you have a small pond. If you've got a big river, you're kind of screwed. So most studies where people measure fitness, there's some special feature about them that makes it more convenient. Hopefully the, that special feature doesn't bias the generality of the results, but that's often unclear. Yeah, so... Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so, so it's, it is... So basically, one way to think about it is, suppose these are now clonal lineages. So those three individuals. You can basically ask which clonal lineage grows faster and therefore, over time, the one that grows faster makes up more and more and more of the population. So you can think about it that way. The other way, which I kind of went through quickly, you can think about it, is one of the concerns with um, uh, uh, this approach is you take the average eigenvalues for the individuals, it doesn't equal the overall population average. So another way to compute the fitness is if you have the overall population average for individual J, you can then look at this here. Remember what this is. This is half the number of offspring that J left and 
cycle one, cycle two, cycle three, cycle four, et cetera. So now since you're, this is basically a modified Euler equation, since you're basically looking at the discount for the entire population, that's another way to get a measure of G where your reference point is now the entire population. But that requires you to have this for the entire population. Whereas over here, you can do this for each individual independent of knowing the growth rate for the entire population. So how so so think of it think about it as growth rates of number of genes that individual leaves in the next generation, right? So if you want to think about that as replacement of genes in the gene pool or growth, I think that's more a matter of semantics. But but I think both those ways are legitimate to look at it. The bottom line is when you have age structure or stage structure populations, you need to have different measures of fitness. Right? And there's a great line in this literature that fitness is something that everyone knows when they see it but they really can't categorize it. Kind of like pornography, like the old definition of, I can't define it, but I know when I see it. They, people often argue that fitness is a, is a construct, artificial construct, and so the correct one to put together for these overlapping generation models, there's still a fair bit of debate. I think these are reasonable ways to think about it. You certainly would use these in place of lifetime reproductive success. And, of course, what you can always do in your analysis you could always take your analysis and analyze it several different ways. What would the data look like? What would my interpretation be if I just used lifetime reproductive success? What would my interpretation be if I used lambda individual? What would my lifetime interpretation be if I used the overall rate? You can do those three different interpretations, look at your data, and see how consistent the results are. If they're inconsistent, you have to discuss that. But you can always do that, right? You've got the data, you can analyze them many different ways. And that's often a good way to get more intuition on a problem, rather than just do, to analyze them one way and leave it at that. Look at them several different ways and see if that alters the interpretation, if so, how, and that may be telling you more things about the biology than just using one method. And that's a good strategy for any, any problem you have. So let's drill down a little bit more on these growth rates and talk about sensitivities and elasticities. And the reason we're doing it <clears throat> is this. What I eventually want to get at is how does this particular trait <clears throat> influence fitness? In an age-structured population or stage-structured population, you can think of that in two ways. Number one, how does the trait influence a particular life history component. Number two, how does it change in that life history component change lambda? So for example, <clears throat> here's my Leslie matrix. <clears throat> if I make a change in this component here, maybe because some trait influences that, <clears throat> how does that change the overall growth rate? What about a change in here? How does that change the overall growth rate? So the way we model perturbations in that is this notion of sensitivities and elasticities. So the sensitivity, S, I, J, in an element in that matrix. So for example, the sensitivity for the 1, 1 element is what does the change in here do? Sensitivity for the, so remember rows and columns, for the 3, 2 element is how this changes. So in a Leslie matrix like this, you've only got elements down here and elements across there. We didn't ask how changes in those change the overall rate. And that's simply the change in the eigenvalue. So the derivative of the eigenvalue with respect to that unit. And it turns out you can actually write what that is. You might think eigenvalues are complicated, but for those of you little matrices, if you remember um, either the spectral decomposition or the singular value decomposition of a matrix, you can take a matrix and write it as a series of matrices times eigenvalues. When you take the derivatives on those, you get this nice result here that basically you can write this sensitivity down in terms of left and right eigenvectors and left and right eigenvalues. I won't go into detail on that because it would take a while, but the bottom line is from features of this matrix, it's very easy to compute the sensitivity. If I, what does a small change in one of these elements do 
to changing the overall growth rate. And we're going to come back and use that to ask, if a trait influences an element, how does that change the overall fitness? Well, it does it by changing that element, and then that element then changes the overall growth rate. So the sensitivity, basically, is how does it change in one of the elements affect the eigenvalues? That's sensitivity. The elasticity talks about a proportional change. So how much, what proportion do I get in the change of lambda by a proportional change in, uh, uh, in one of the components? And you can then connect that and basically show that I can write lambda here, the overall growth rate, I can basically write that as the sum of the elements times their sensitivities, and I can also write that as um, the, uh, 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 the overall growth rate times the, the uh, elasticities. So we're going to come back and talk about these a little bit. And again, the, the idea here is that if I perturb an element, how does that influence the overall growth rate? Well, I can simply ask, okay, if I perturb the element, what's the change? That's the sensitivity, because it's a change given that. Or I could ask, what is the, what's the proportional change in the growth rate when I make a proportional change in the element? And that then is this expression here, which is elasticity. And you can think about that as what is the change in log lambda given a change in log of that individual value. These things sound similar, but it turns out it's the elasticities that matter. And we'll come back and talk about that. So the take home point for now is we have expressions that allow you to ask, what does a small change in one of the components do to changing the growth rate? And we're going to tie that in with traits um, a couple lectures from now. Okay. So that, that's your initial introduction to measures of fitness. I started out with standard fitness component decomposition, which is largely due to two papers by, uh, by Wade and Arnold. Then I took you into kind of the, the extensions of that, and the extensions are these Astra models by Shaw and Geyer, and also into age-structured measures of fitness. Then we talked about eigenvalues correspond to uh, individual fitnesses. Then we talked about this notion of elasticities and sensitivities. A sensitivity says, if I fiddle with one element, how does that change the eigenvalue? The elasticities say, if I make a proportional change in one element, what's the corresponding proportional change in, in the growth rate. And we're going to come back and see where elasticities come in. We talk about matching trait changes to fitness changes. Okay. Just covered a bunch of stuff. And again, you see, the reason I put this course together is think about how different each of the lectures are, right? The machinery use is quite different. The problems are quite different. But they're all addressing this issue of selection. And most people aren't trained in more than one method, much less the whole swath of methods that are available. So the idea is to make your toolbox as big as possible so you attack your problem with the best tools rather than forcing a problem on the one or two tools you have. Okay. So questions for a break? Yeah. Hmm. That's a great question. So the way you actually estimate that is you can actually compute that directly from the matrix. And I kind of kind of went over that really quickly because I wanted, didn't want to get too bogged down in matrices. But since you love matrices, we can talk about that. So this is the actual value here. So basically, um, so what are these expressions here? So we have what's called, the, the way I've written an eigenvalue here it's what's called the right eigenvector and the right eigenvalue. If I take the transpose, so now I basically have this thing on the other side. So this is the vector uh, is pre-multiplied by the matrix. Here the vector is post-multiplied. That gives you left and right eigenvalues. And the connection basically is land, uh, taking L, it's, taking its eigenvalue gives you the left eigenvalue taking L transpose gives you the right eigenvalue. And those are the elements up here. So the ith shape element, it's the ith uh, left on the jth right, and these basically then, this term down here, which gives you a number, inner product of two vectors is a number, 
That just simply depends upon the corresponding eigenvectors. So, so basically, the, you get it from, if, if I give you an L matrix, that's sufficient. You can just have a little script that, that, that does the decomposition and, and basically gives you the matrix that gives you elements everywhere. So these things are the same for all of them, and these simply depend upon computing the, the left and corresponding left and right ones. So matrix, you could take any matrix and decompose it into components. And one of those decompositions is called the singular value decomposition. The other is called the spectral decomposition. They're often very similar. And you can then, it breaks the pieces off, makes it easier to take derivatives. And you break those pieces off and you get results that look like this. Yeah, so, so you, you, in order to do this, you'd have to have some sort of longitudinal data because what you're basically doing, I'll just go over here, is you're basically, you have several different time points you've measured this at. So you can't apply these corrections to a snapshot, right? Because what you need to do is basically have, so if your snapshot is simply one episode, it may be that individual four, you may have like five episodes of mating, you catch episode three, individual one, had great matings in one and two and very little in three. So you wouldn't capture that. Again, that's this whole notion of the invisible fraction. You can't capture selection that you, you haven't scored for. And that introduces enormous biases. Again, measuring fitness isn't for wussies. It's really hard to do. And you can only do it in specific systems, in right conditions. And that raises huge issues of just how reasonable are they. Now, a really cool play on this is what people are now doing in yeast. Some really neat stuff coming out of Stanford, um, uh, Dmitry Petrov's lab and others mainly. What they do is they take yeast and they randomly insert randomly generated barcodes into yeast. So my yeast population now is all uniquely identified and you let it grow. And you can then, with, high, with, with basically with, with sequencing, look for barcodes that increase or decrease. And so what they're actually able to do is they're actually able to track the fitnesses of newly arising mutations in yeast, which is super cool. Expanding that technology outside the laboratory to natural populations, I don't see how you do it, but there may be some interesting tricks you can do with tagging, et cetera. So the bottom line is measuring fitness in natural populations is hard. Trying to detect selection with markers is easy, relatively speaking. So most people, this is kind of the hardest area. These are year-long projects, multi-year projects, that maybe give you one or two papers. So, you know, it's this is hard, but this is this is the putting the ecology into those measurements of fitness. Oh, absolutely. So let's go back and, and look at that. So there's an astro model. Those are over living generations. I could have flowers in generations one, two, and three. And this structure actually builds that into it. So if 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 I if you flowered and died, you'd basically have something that would basically be a single app. But this is overlapping generations because, for example, suppose you have a lot of flowers in generation one and not in generation three, but your lifetime reproductive success for plant one. The sum of these is the same for plant one and plant two. Those that put more in here have a higher fitness. So you can certainly handle overlapping generations in the Astro Framework. The Astro Framework basically allows you simply to represent the life history as a graph. You can then take that graph and make a Leslie matrix or an age projection matrix out of that. And if you're really interested in doing that, read Cal's, uh, Caswell's book. Because um, you talk a lot about these age structure and state structure model here and over here. Asian-based? Well, I, I mean, in the sense that people are measuring. So there's the issue of, there's an issue of analysis, the issue of measuring. So the analysis is pretty straightforward once you do the measurements. So the issue is, this is a, remember I said a real important bottleneck is how you phenotype? This is hardcore phenotyping, right? Where the phenotyping is fitness. You've got to tag individual flowers and follow them over the years. 
So I'm not sure what you mean by using agent base to get around that. That's more of a... Yeah, well, the nice thing is when you get these graphical models, you can actually write down analytic solutions for them. That's what the Astro models do. So, so the great thing, the, the, the way to think, that's a great question. The way to think about it is, is they have kind of two different purposes. Number one, this I think is easier for a lot of people to interpret when you've got a complicated life history structure. People often have a hard time looking at loops and matrices and stuff. Here it's very clear what's going on. But I can always write that as a matrix. And what I would then do to analyze the fitness here is I'd take this life history structure, I would then put that in matrix form, and then for each individual compute the lambdas for them. When you write it out in this form, you can also figure out what the distribution of lifetime fitness is going to be. So uh, basically, this is a series of zero truncated Poisson random variables. And you may ask how that happens. You can build that up from the model because you've got Bernoulli, 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 and Poisson, and we'll talk all about that. So the advantage of writing this structure here is uh, you can not only write down the matrix, but then you can ask about what's the distribution of those counts going to be, and that distribution of the counts then allows you to do the correct residuals for your analysis. You don't have to assume the fitnesses are normally distributed. You can actually get the exact distribution, and that follows from these life history graphs, as we'll talk about in detail, I think, probably this, I think this afternoon, when we talk about those astronomers. Well, well, so you, you, you would analyze that in a matrix form if you want to look at individual fitnesses. You'd use this structure to compute your residuals for the secondary task of asking about what does the residuals of the fitness look. What's the distribution of fitness values? Because what's the sum of three zero truncated Poissons? That's not normal. And the Astro models basically calculate that for you. So this is done to figure out where you put distributions, we talk about uh, generalized linear models, we'll talk about that, but you can also think about this. So the, 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 the issue is you can do two different things with this graph. Number one is you can put your data in a matrix form and compute individual fitness. I think that's what Jurich is doing. Number two is you can use this graph to figure out what the appropriate statistical distribution should be for these. If you assume what the form of the distribution is at each step, you can then put the form for what the distribution should be on here. The reason you need the form of the distribution is once you observe those values to do a regression, you then have to figure out what the, um, the probability distribution of those is so you have the right distribution for the residuals. If you assume normal, it doesn't typically work because you've got a lot of stuff at zero, a lot of things with zero fitness. So normal doesn't fit. A zero truncated, exponential family of some form does much better. And we'll talk about that. So that's the, that's the main reason people use Astro models is to account for the right error structure, but you can also use them to represent the life history. So it's, it's the same graph using it for two different things. So if you take this graph, you can put your data in a matrix and compute individual fitness, but this graph also shows you how you connect the different distributions you assume at each step in there, we'll go through that, to figure out what the distribution of residuals among the fitness is going to be. And you'll need that to do proper, uh, proper statistical analysis on your data once you want to associate it with traits.